a lot of my initial questions in the 11 questions are kind of foundational Mm -hmm. uh, first act backstory kind of questions. And then, you know, the later ones address low points and all that stuff. This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Aaron Mendelson, man. How you doing, Aaron? I'm good. How are you, Alex? I'm good, man. I'm good. Just, you know, hanging in here in this uh, this crazy, wacky world that we're living in. Yeah, likewise. Where are you? You're based... Um... I'm in L.A. I'm in, and I'm, I'm in Burbank. Oh, in Burbank. All right. So if I threw a rock really hard from Studio City, I might... It might land in Toluca Lake. But it might it might land in Toluca Lake and, and ripples might splash onto me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, it is a crazy time. Uh, I, 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 I can't even, I've talked about it so much as far as the, the, the COVID thing. But, you know, we're doing what we can. And the industry is changing on a daily basis. Uh, nobody knows where the hell anything is going. Um, no one ever did, by the way. So. This is obviously, obviously. Um, but now even more so. Like before there was some sort of, some sort of guidance. Like you knew right. that. On Friday, there was going to be released a blockbuster movie in the summer, and it was going to generate X amount of dollars, more than likely. We had that certainty. Yes. We don't have that now. <laughs> no, it's true. It's, uh, but it makes it interesting. I think it, um, it kind of – it was good for uh, the world and Hollywood to uh, kind of have a reset, have a little bit of a pause button. You know, it's interesting that the, um, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter – uh, issue has really risen to the mm-hmm. forefront during this time mm-hmm. uh, of reflection and reset because, uh, boy, I'm, I'm hearing a lot in the writers community uh, how, you know, we think we're this progressive, uh, liberal, um, uh, egalitarian community. And it probably compared to a, lo- a lot of others, we are. But um, there's so much even systemic racism on bias that happens in the writing community, in the screenwriting community, and television writing, that this has given us a opportunity to kind of reflect, yeah, reset and see how we can do things differently going forward. Uh, there's, there's, there's no question about it. Um, I mean, I mean, growing up, I remember watching. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Latino man. Uh, have been all my life, and uh, <laughs> and um, I remember watching uh, Looney Tunes and watching Speedy Gonzalez, and I'd be just like. And I never thinking twice about it, but like as I got older, like whoa, that's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, that's fairly <laughs> like okay, all right. Um, so look, it's 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 something that's inbred in and in, inbred in, in, in us, but uh, it's ingrained in the in in the fabric, unfortunately, and something hopefully we'll be able to do. And and we as as filmmakers and writers uh, have the power to really do some change because filmmaking movies, television, storytelling is the most powerful uh, medium to start that change uh, without question. Absolutely true. Absolutely um, true. So we started off heavy, so we're going to go a little lighter now. Um, <laughs> so so um, how did you get started in the business? I got started, I knew I was going to be a screenwriter since I was five years old living in Anchorage, Alaska. Um And I knew I was going to go to UCLA and I was going to be a screenwriter, even when I was in kindergarten in in Mrs. McKinnon's class. Obviously. I knew it. And I made it happen. I went to UCLA. I studied screenwriting at UCLA and then uh, emerged into uh, Hollywood with a script under my arm that everyone passed on. Uh, uh, Everyone passed on. It it was, well, it was a terrible script, so it's not surprising. (laughs) Um, and then I wrote another one and I wrote another one. I got over this sort of illusion that you write one screenplay and the the world's going to be the path to your doorstep. It really was an iterative process, uh, for me and, and my screenplays got better. But what was interesting is the thing that really broke through for me is that I wrote a script about my family. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wrote a script about how my dad came out of the closet after 27 years of marriage and how, you know, obviously that threw something of a hand grenade into the family. I mean, ultimately a good one because he needed to be himself. But it was um, something of a disruptive event. So I wrote a, a movie about that in the early 90s. And everyone passed on it. So because it wasn't the right time. It was not the right time. They were just not doing it. And finally, um, uh, Lifetime, the Lifetime Network stepped up. And uh, we made the movie with uh, 
uh, Gene Smart playing my mom and John Terry, who you may remember from Lost, mm -hmm. playing playing my dad. And um, it was something of a, a little groundbreaking film. And so that was sort of my uh, that was one of my first uh, projects. And it really took kind of like stepping back and writing something that was kind of highly personal uh, that, uh, that that broke me through. So it's the opposite of everything that everyone tells you is not to write something personal. <laughs> Like don't yeah. yeah don't write a movie about your family that's never going to sell is basically the the advice I've heard oh. a thousand times. <laughs> I know it depends on the family. I mean, that, true, people, true. Families are interesting. <laughs> you know, my aunt, my aunt Bina, but let me tell you, her stories. <laughs> no, Aunt Bina is not interesting. Right. Uh, you know, your dad coming out of the closet and and uh, marriage, uh, you know, kind of breaking up because of it. That's a little more interesting. Although even now. Uh, that's uh, that's kind of passe. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Grace and Frankie alone. I mean, they they built a series based on that concept. <laughs> that's right. And, and they took the whole thing uh, and and added a bunch of a bunch of spice to it, if you, as they say. Yeah, you have um, to add spice nowadays. So yeah, but it, it, and that's another thing really interesting to talk about is timing, because sometimes there the certain script or certain movie, certain filmmaker, all everything has to come together, kind of like in this vortex, and hit all at the same time for certain projects to go where five years earlier, 10 years earlier, it doesn't happen as like the script, like you were walking around with the script. Like you remember, I remember what unforgiven was bouncing around Hollywood for like 20 or 30 years. Bodyguard was bouncing around Hollywood for like 30 years. Yeah. Well, they weren't going to make Westerns until finally, you know, Clint Eastwood stepped up and said, you know, um, Hey, I'm the Western guy. Let's, let's make this Western. Uh, bodyguard, you know, they had to get Whitney Houston, you know, a big you know, uh, kind of iconic celebrity to do mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, a lot of it's timing luck. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it's just courage. You know, someone, a producer, a studio has the balls to say, uh, yeah, I'll take a chance with this. It, it's not it's not a superhero film. It's, you know, uh, a strange uh, social commentary with a black lead in a white liberal neighborhood. And it's a horror film. I'll take a chance on that. And uh, and then they're surprised when people are like, God, I've really wanted to see that. I've never seen that before. But there's just not a lot of courage in this town. They kind of know that it's, you know, they want to have some precedent. But isn't, but I mean, I mean it's, I've said this before on the show. I mean, this whole town is run on fear. I mean, the entire town is run on fear and, and, and mitigating uh, loss, not gain, taking risks for gains. But mitigating loss because if you lose, you lose your job, you lose your reputation, uh, and it, and it's like one. It's like before I remember back in the, even in the eighties and the nineties where studios would take multiple swings at the bat every year with their films. They'd do thirty, forty movies. They'd take some risky stuff. They'd do some study stuff. But now it's like every single one has to be a home run, or people get fired. Studios might even go down depending on the size of the budget. Yeah, it's a shame. It's sort of a Reggie Jackson approach. Um, you know, it's all home runs or nothing. Like you said, there right. used to be those. They were happy to have singles and doubles with these kind of lower budgeted dramas. Uh, the 70s were filled with these oh. wonderful films, you know, yeah. that were, you know, the conversation and, uh, you know, these great um, uh, blow up and these great taxi driver, <laughs> taxi driver. I mean, Can I'm you not imagine? sure. That, well, it had you have to turn taxi driver into a superhero or supervillain movie in order to get it uh made today and well they did joke. they did the joke i know right <laughs> that's the only way they'll do it if we could put the joker in it then maybe we'll give you 20 million bucks to make this film how much was the joker to make it wasn't that uh, the joker was probably 80 or 90 yeah but that's and that's, and that's still pretty low in because it's not a it's a character piece it's not a special effects movie there's yes yeah, like the king of comedy but with a guy with makeup <laughs> on his face and it's funny because robert de niro and scorsese was attached as a producer at one point so it's just it just comes full circle <laughs> see you could see uh what's his name todd um uh, who did todd that Phillips. Phillips. he yeah. probably said okay guys i know it seems like an art film but the reality is this film has been made before and it did well as King of Comedy, Taxi Driver. So, you know, and we had the superhero thing. So it's a hit. Yeah. Come on, give us some money. And they made a lot of money with that film. They made a shit ton of money. Uh, it was a trivia question the other day that said the Joker was the largest, the highest grossing R-rated film in history worldwide. Is it? Did it finally, did it break that? Jesus. Indeed. 
Yeah, that's and that says something to Hollywood that we want this kind of storytelling. Yeah. We want Character this kind of story. R R, not PG thirteen. R tough tough um, tough themes. Um, I mean, that's a disturbing. Mean, the Joker is a disturbing film. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a disturbing film, and his performance is so just. Oh, well, we you see. Oh, I, I knew this was going to happen, Aaron. I knew this was going to happen. We're just going to keep we going. Digress. Oh. <laughs> we digress. Yeah. Um, so with all of this, we were talking about great cinema um, of the past. Um, you have to tell me a little bit about your time at the Criterion Collection, sir. Criterion Collection was a dream job. So when I was at UCLA, uh, I saw, you know, I answered an ad to go work for a company called The Voyage yeah, uh, Company. Voyager. Voyager Company, yeah. Voyager. Voy Voyager Company. Got it. Yeah. I forgot. And they were doing the early days of the Criterion Collection, these movies on Laserdisc. They had just come out with Citizen Kane and, mm -hmm. and the, their first few uh, films on Laserdisc, on CAB or CLB. CLB. Well, see, so now you see, you're talking a completely different language than most people listening. I understood everything you said. <laughs> so I know what a CAV is, I know what a CLV is, and I also know what a Laserdisc is. So for the kids yeah. listening, a Laserdisc is, imagine a DVD. But the size of a record. So um, a laser disc is imagine a DVD that's much bigger, but then uh, the quality is still standard definition. So it's very still, but better than VHS by yeah. by by miles. But you would have to midway through the movie get up and flip it, <laughs> flip it like a pancake, and then put it back in and continue watching it. Now if that on CLV. Uh, is, now we're doing a laser disc tutorial. Uh, on CLV, you would have lesser quality, but more time on the side of the disc. I don't remember yes. what the timing was. I know on CAV, it's like half hour per side. I thought CAV. I thought CAV was half hour per side. I think CLV it might have been an hour. hour. CLV was one hour, and CAV also gave you the opportunity to interact more. You could um, you could do more interaction with the CAV laser disc, and so the Criterion Collection, as yeah. you may remember would always have special edition, um, you know, a supplemental material at the end of the Laserdisc. So if mm -hmm. you got the CAV version of, um, of a 2001 A Space Odyssey, which mm -hmm. I produced, we had a whole side filled with extra goodies oh, from, yeah. uh, straight from Stanley Kubrick's estate. Uh, that we added on to the uh, to the end of the film, so you could take a real deep dive into the the library of you, materials that went into it. Did you speak to Mr. Kubrick at all? Were you in, ton in contact with him? Our my boss did. Um, he was, you know, he never left England. Uh, right. He sent us a new uh, cut, though. He sent us like a two inch. He did a new transfer for the. He was a big fan of the Criterion Collection, mm -hmm. so he did a new transfer of his film and fixed a couple of things. And so we got a really pristine, beautiful uh, print. To, On two inch. To, On two yeah, inch? two inch. To strike the, <laughs> I know it sounds, I'm not even <laughs> sure what that means, but. It, two, it was a two inch tape. It was like a mastering tape back in the day. Um, it was, and two inch was like, you know, pro, pro. You're at, at the high pro. level. Now yeah. it's probably like 80 inches, but <laughs> now it's all digital. But, uh, but the greatest pleasure I had was that I got to produce a special edition laser disc of The Graduate, which is my favorite film. It's And uh, so much fun. We got um, uh, a second audio track from this UCLA professor, uh, Howard, I um, can't remember his name, but he did this amazing second audio. Oh. He knew that film like the back of his hand. I got it. I, I was telling you um, off off air that the graduate was one of my favorite laser discs because when I I was in high school when I saw it, um, I was collecting Criterion's back in the day, and mm. it was the first kind of experience to like film theory, like real right. real film theory. And I mean, he analyzed every freaking frame of that it was just magical to listen and yeah. for people listen for people on, uh, that are listening you have to understand that there i think criterion was the one that came up with the concept of director commentary i don't think yes. there was a director commentary prior to that there may have been one or two special editions here or there but it really became our our whole metier and and the supplemental materials and it really became criterion collection became the you know, kind of the pinnacle, cinephile, of, the cinephile you know, place, the cinephiles. Exactly. And I think they still, you know, they have a criterion channel. They still oh, come yeah. out uh, DVDs. Uh, so, 
it's but that was really you know for someone who was in film school at, at UCLA oh. at the time it was, it was a dream job and it taught me a lot about storytelling so yeah I'm, and we could talk about cartoon for about another hour but uh, we we will we shall move on Aaron um now I'm going to pitch you a movie it's about a dog who um plays basketball for a high school it was I think high school team um uh, would that pitch work? No. <laughs> By the way, that's a terrible idea. It's a no horrible, one horrible, horrible, absurd. It's absurd. Silly idea. And by the way, we did pitch it. Like that? We, we pitched Air Bud and um, everyone said that's ridiculous. So we ended up, uh, my old writing partner, Paul Tamasey, and I uh, specced the script for Air Bud and we didn't just, you know, uh, think of this, that, that ridiculous idea and then write it and then go find a dog. We met the dog first. Obviously. There, you know, there was a, uh, we were with the Broadway Danny Rose of agents, uh, back then. Uh, he represented us. He represented dogs. He represented, <laughs> you know, one legged, uh, bearded ladies. Got it. Fair enough. So hot, like the upper echelon. Got it. Upper, upper, upper echelon of agents. Yes. And so we came in uh, the office one day and, and there was Buddy sitting there and our agents like, guys, guys, you got to check out this dog. This dog's remarkable. He's obsessed with balls. And we're like, ah, that doesn't sound like, no, no, you got to. And he started throwing balls at this dog and, you know, and, and the dog would, you know, bounce him back to us and, catch baseballs and hockey pucks and he's like you got to write a movie for this dog he's david letterman's favorite stupid pet trick and we're like okay it's not exactly what we envisioned for ourselves when we got out of film school <laughs> right. we're writing we're gonna write taxi driver and stuff and we all you know, are uh, obviously my gay my gay father story hey. um but we saw that this was a pretty remarkable dog and we realized okay it's a pretty stupid pet trick really that this dog can do he'd be doing halftime shows and stuff like right, that right. but we realized that really at at the core if we wrote a movie that's a, a really a love story between a boy and a dog and that the reason that the dog um plays basketball is because he he realizes the boy loves basketball and the boy is lonely he just moved to this new town oh wow and uh, he sees like playing basketball with this boy would actually, in, you know, awaken this boy and enliven him and, and empower him. And then we knew we knew when we had that little post-it note of of kind of uh, what I call the, the central idea, mm -hmm. which is everything the dog does, he does for the boy. Once we knew we had that emotional through line, um, that foundation, we knew that we could prop up this move, we could build a movie on, on this kind of silly gimmick. And, um, and the movie just kind of flowed from us at that point. And we, we wrote it and, but then all the studios passed on the script. They're like, this is ridiculous. You know, a dog doesn't play basketball. We're like, well, we have one that does. They, they could not be bothered. Yeah. Right. So really, you know, talk about courage, this little Canadian, uh, production company, Keystone Productions had made one or two like erotic thrillers at the time. <laughs> Skinamax, Skinamax style. Skinamax right. films. They saw the they saw the promise in this film. Uh, uh, and, <laughs> uh, this should be a this should be a, a, a script on how I, Air Bud was made. Air Bud, the making of. <laughs> Start off with soft car porn. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I won't even tell you about the strip club they took me to uh, when they were shooting this film because this is a family uh, podcast. Obviously, right? obviously, obviously. So. Um, I resisted, mm -hmm. resisted, you know. Uh, so uh, we wrote that they loved the script. They optioned it. And then they brought on Charlie Martin Smith to direct. Charlie Martin Smith, you may remember, was an actor in um, American Graffiti and a lot of other films, Never oh, Cry Wolf. Mm -hmm. He was kind of that uh, toad, toady character. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember him. So he worked with Carol Ballard on Never Cry Wolf. Uh, Carol Ballard did The Black Stallion. Yes. Which is one of the most beautiful, yeah. moving films ever. And a boy and a horse. And so uh, Charlie brought that kind of ethos to the film. Uh, kind of a Carol Ballard-esque, gentle, moving, not a ton of dialogue. I mean, he really kind of like 
in our rewrite encouraged us to really kind of make it more moving and more emotional and quiet and more like old yeller and all these films. And so I think that he did a beautiful job of conducting this film, directing this film and making something that, um, you know, we thought was just this kind of little, little silly film. Right. And it's kind of become, it's become a thing. Oh no. It's, I mean, I remember when air bud came out and I was like, like anybody else who saw the poster, it's just ridiculous. But yeah, by the we, way, the, yeah, they're right. The, yeah, they're right there. They're right behind you. Um, it's it's ridiculous. It's a dog playing basketball, like the dogs don't play basketball. But uh, also for everyone listening, uh, Walt Disney picked it up um, to to yes. distribute it. Um, Walt and Disney himself from the grave <laughs> came out and said to AFM and bought, we actually we were um, at AFM in '97 or whenever after mm-hmm. we shot the film. The film wasn't even finished. Mm-hmm. There was a, a a promo reel that Keystone made. And uh, there was a bidding war over the film just based on the promo reel because they saw the dog was actually doing this and that it was a good film. And they bought it. That's so, and so Disney bought it. At a, like hit, Disney heard about it at AFM and was like, yeah. no, 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 we need. I mean, it is a Disney film. I mean, if you're going to do it, that's that's a, right. that's a that's a good route to go back then even. Um, Disney would never release that in a million years today. Um, but again, it's about timing. Right. It's about time. Right. Disney Plus would release it. But Disney Plus, yeah. yeah, it's too small. I mean, it's a four million dollar film. It looks like a little tiny character. It, it sort of has a, a a very low budget uh, vibe to it. But um, yeah, but they recognize the sweetness of it. Right. They also probably recognize there was a ten film franchise in this thing, and they're like, Ka-ching. wait a minute. Ka-ching. Well, I mean, so right, so you got Air Bud going, so now it gets released, and it does it does fairly well. Yeah, <laughs> it it does. How much did it? Did you remember how much it made? I think it, you know, it made like thirty million at the box office, which um, is not a ton, but for a four million dollar film, uh, it was great. It did very well. But did on, video. but video, it must have just sold hundreds, of, like on DVD. I, my, house, my house in Studio City, I bought from the first uh, residual check I got from the video release of uh, of the film. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, it, it, and I can only imagine. So, so how did the town treat you as a screenwriter? Because you're the Air Bud guy now. Like Air Bud guy can't he can't write Taxi Driver? That's just not. It yeah. can't write Taxi Driver. So how did the town treat you? What doors opened up? Because I always love when I have someone on the show who's had um, not only success but phenomenal success in in a in a small in in a way in an area of our business. Yeah, I'm always fascinated to see how that took you to the next place or what opportunities presented itself or how, how the town treat you. Cause a lot of times there's this, this kind of myth of like, Oh, they just must've just pulled up the truck and just dumped money on him, and he could do whatever he wants. I'm like, nah, it's something. It's an interesting line, you know, writing a film that was very specific like that and very, very genre or subgenre like that. It did open up some opportunities. My partner and I uh, sold a couple of pitches uh, after that. We were hired on a couple of things. They're always family films. Um, you know, so we definitely got pigeonholed, family, comedy, that kind of thing. But we also, you know, because Air Bud was so, so narrow that it wasn't like we were suddenly on the A-list. It was very kind of a small bucket. However, what's happened since is that ever since – is that whenever we would try to, or I, we broke up a couple years later and I went off on my own. Whenever I tried to do something, which is really my forte, which is character driven drama, <laughs> they're like, they look at, at 13 films on my, you know, cause I get credit on all the air bud movies. I only wrote the first two, mm-hmm. uh, but they see this huge IMDB page filled with air bud credits. And then a couple of other family films that I've done. Um, and they don't believe that I can do drama. Right. Uh, so I've had to try to reinvent myself by specking drama scripts, drama pilots to really to show and prove that I'm more than just kind of a, a one a one trick dog. <laughs> <laughs> and as like you've said, that that franchise went on to spawn with 12 other movies. 12 sequels, I think, because my daughters have seen all of them. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, it's the space buddies, the spooky buddies, the yeah. treasure buddies, the, yeah. and I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine they're just sitting around because I know you don't have anything to do with these. So, um, 
uh, but they, I'm sure there's some executives somewhere sitting around like, all right, what can we do? Let's get a bunch of puppies and put them on a treasure hunt. Oh, uh, then now they're in a haunted house. Oh, yeah. now let's it's put them in space. space. Yeah, sure. Like happen. a superhero. There was a superhero one too. I remember yeah. they all got superpowers as dogs. Like yeah. it, it, and they talk now where Air Bud didn't talk. No, no now they're, now no. they're talking it's, dogs. <laughs> it's become something of a twisted, um, there, there are a lot of negative words I can say, but at the same time, <laughs> Uh, they, you know, they would send us a check every year when they would make these things. So I can't complain. No, you know, we originally envisioned maybe three buddy films because the original dog the trilogy. could play basketball, a trilogy. He could play basketball, which was remarkable. He could play football, which became the second film because he could catch these huge spirals. Uh, he also could play soccer. So we envisioned three, maybe four because of hockey and, you know, uh, volleyball. I mean, maybe. Yeah, well, they did. I think they ended up doing volleyball. You know, I mean, we envisioned at least it's sort of staying within sports and we wanted it to stay real where it really felt like this was a dog in a human world. And, you know, but then eventually the, the sports movie started running out of steam and the Keystone people came up with the quite brilliant idea to base it on the puppies. And uh, those puppy videos made a fortune. Oh, my God. They made a fortune. They just kept they make them for like, you know, three or four million dollars every year. And they would sell like hotcakes. And because uh, kids love oh. their talking puppies. I mean, well, it's, it's it's talking puppies. I mean, it's not a it's it's not hard. Like I always tell people, like, if you want to you want to make a successful movie, have a dog save Christmas. Like that's. Yeah. You got a dog saving Christmas. You're good. <laughs> It's funny you should say that. Because <laughs> my next film, sir, is about uh, talking puppies who save Christmas. And I think not, that's already been done. <laughs> they're fully grown dogs, but they do save Christmas, yes. <laughs> so what I'm hearing from you is that you're very upset that the, these, this company has not taken the true essence of what you yeah. had in mind, the seriousness of what the art, the, the art of the basketball playing basketball dog playing. in the original film and have bastardized it for they money. For money, of all things. I mean, we so went Hollywood. into the Airbud business. <laughs> we went into the Airbud business for the art of it, for the artistry. And, you know, we wanted to make the Joker of of of, uh, of, of, of dog, went, of of dog basketball, movies. Of basketball playing dog movies. That's right. And they went off to make uh, the Green Lantern. You know, I mean, so. I mean the, the, the horror, sir. The horror. No. horror. Um, and I'm assuming that you're so, again, you're so upset about this that every time they send you that residual check, you just rip it up. I just give it to charity. <laughs> I give it to uh, dog rescue. Yes. Fair enough. Thank Fair you. enough. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Um, the whole Airbud uh, saga. Oh, and it's, you know, you mentioned the, the I, I teach a, I teach a couple of classes at Loyola Marymount. I've been teaching there for a few years. And a big conversation we always have is, do you brand yourself um, as a certain kind of writer? Or do you um, follow your muse because you may want to write a whole bunch of different things? And it really is a dilemma. Because if you do brand yourself, you actually can be at the top of, uh, or you can be on the lists as, you know, like Zach Penn very early on branded himself as a great action writer, a action adventure kind of writer. And he's um, formulated a tremendous successful uh, career out of this. You look at Jordan Peele and these other guys that are, you know, uh, are kind of sticking in their lane in terms of the kind of things they write and they have a lot of success. But as writers, we often, you know, we want to write different things. But then the problem is then the town doesn't know what kind of writer you are. So here I am, the Air Bud guy. They're like, oh, we've got a dog. I get approached with every dog movie, Lassie, you know, Rin Tin Tin. Every dog movie uh, or TV show comes my way, which is great. However, I'm really interested in writing, you know, more like the taxi driver. I'm really interested in true stories. Mm -hmm. So it's it is hard. It's a bit of a dilemma. I almost feel like because I did follow my muse into independent film shortly after I did Air Bud. Uh, I went off to Florida and shot a, a R-rated independent character uh, drama. And it did nothing for my career. It set me back, as a matter of fact. Right. 
Because I came back and they're like, wait, aren't you the Air Bud guy? What is this? Well, that's a very interesting conversation because the town in general, they need to put you in a box. They they can't comprehend uh, someone who's multifaceted uh, that could do – multiple kind of storytelling. I mean, we all don't have the, the, the privilege of uh, of Tarantino's career who jumps genre and does whatever the hell he wants. But that's a that's an anomaly. He's an anomaly in, in the writing space. Sorkin, um, even Sorkin stays kind of in his lane. Yeah, well, even, you know, Tarantino stylistically, um, the style of writing uh, oh, of his films is kind of the same. You could say the same thing about um, Shane Black. Shane Black or Wes Anderson, you know, a lot of these guys, they do move around into different genres, but the style is the same. Uh, but this town does want to put you in a box. The, the, and, the, and that's so. So the question is, do you like the, like your students saying, do you brand yourself? Because like when you were saying you're like, I, I got niched down to this little bucket. I But I, when you were saying that in my mind, I'm like, yeah, but you were at the top of that bucket. Um, well, maybe in the middle. Middle, but no, but the point is like every in dog movie in the dog, dog family <laughs> film bucket. space, which is like yeah. a, a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche. Yeah. You're the top dog. Oh God, I had to say it. Oh, so bad. Um, but you're, but you, but you're, you know, you're getting those phone calls. So as a working writer, it, it is, it is a good thing to, to kind of niche yourself down and create this kind of brand for yourself. But as a creator, you might want to go out somewhere and do other things. Has there ever been in, 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 in Hollywood? I know there has to have been, but there's been like, you know, let's say, you know, that the Air Bud guy, which is you, um, decides to write Taxi Driver, but sends it out under a pseudonym. And then it, it gets a whole lot of heat. And then who is this? Who is this writer? And then your agent's like, no, he's like very Charlie Kaufman style. He doesn't even want to talk to anybody. And they're like, and that just builds up the hype even more to the point where they're sending millions of dollars. But who's the guy? I'm like, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. He's my client. I, I, client privilege. I can't. <laughs> Can you imagine? You should do that. I'm saying that's a brilliant idea, Alex. <laughs> I should have done that. I should have done that. That's you still such, can. Could, yeah, I still can. That's right. You absolutely could because by the time that they've already sent you the check, like, okay, if we're going to give this guy $2 million for this, this script, we need to know who he is. I'm like, after the check clears, we'll tell you who he is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll reveal it. We'll reveal it. So imagine if they've got, you've got Shawshank Redemption in their hand that they just bought. And they're like, well, who wrote it? It's like, what's the Air Bud guy? What? Yeah, <laughs> the reveal. The blood. <laughs> draining from their faces what have we done it was like um when uh peter jackson got uh where uh what's this guy the guy he's run, used to run on new um new line he hired peter jackson off the pitch for the lord of the rings films um and peter had done the frighteners and a couple other films uh, but, heavenly creatures and heavenly creatures which was a fantastic film heavenly great. creatures and and um and uh frighteners uh, which was also great but Look, he's not Cameron. I mean, he he didn't have it's not Spielberg. He didn't have a history of like massive films. And then they saw one of his first films. I forgot the name of it, but it's like this really bad. Uh, I think it's called bad, something bad. It's literally called something bad, or like the word and then bad, bad, bad taste. I think it's called bad taste. Um, and it's like this Corman style heads exploding horror comedy ish thing like really bad and there and then they said oh my god we've just given this guy 200 million dollars like are you, what are we doing <laughs> well and that's a shame because that was early on in his career right it was a certain type of film yeah they you know he proven himself since and but yet they they still scared they were still scared fear fear like fear. you said Fear, yeah. fear, fear, fear. So let's talk about your book. Um, you have a book called The 11 Fundamental... Uh, well, first of all, it's called The 11 Fundamental... Questions. The questions. Fundamental questions, a guide to a better screenplay. Right. So what? Um, so let's talk about that. What are these questions? And you don't have to give you the whole kit and caboodle yeah. away now, but... You have to buy the book to get you have all to, the questions. Obviously. But if, let's talk about a couple of questions. Well, first, you know, the... The inspiration for the book, I've um, I've had a story breaking technique for uh, probably 15 years now where uh, I would um, ask myself a series of questions that were meant as kind of like a stress test. 
um, to test the story, the storytelling. And, um, and then I started teaching that technique in seminars. And then people started saying, you should, you should put it into a book. And so finally I wrote a book. It was actually 10 questions, uh, initially. And then Billy Ray, Mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, who I sat on the board of directors of the writers guild with for many years and is a fellow Bruin like me, he suggested an 11th question, which became question number three. Um, and uh, so I added that because, you know, when Billy Ray suggests <laughs> things, you just you, it's, you, you I listen. To, I'm telling you, 10 fundamental questions doesn't work as well as 11. There are actual there is science behind the number 11, the number seven and the number nine on on the psychology of like if you if you're ever looking, you'll never see a top four list yeah never you'll never see a top four you'll see a top five right you'll see a top 10 um and maybe a top three maybe but never like a top six or you know but you will see a top but you will see a top seven every once in a while yes or or the seven best or something like that so there's something to do with number like if you said 12 fundamental questions doesn't it doesn't ring no is it weird it's weird right it's weird um and 11, I get to say that my book goes to 11. <laughs> for, so, all, for all those Spinal Tap fans out there. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny, as a, another digression, speaking of uh, those numbers, one of the things I did at the Writers Guild was start the 101 uh, best screenplays, greatest screenplays list. All right. That was a project of mine. And we got the, uh, uh, you know, the membership of the Writers Guild West and East to vote on it. And uh, we decided it should be 100, but we're like, no, let's do 101 101. because that's kind of interesting. It's like, what just missed? Well, let's add that to the list, 101. So interestingly, when we did the 101 funniest screenplays list and had it voted on, you know, had had the votes come in from, you know, our 10,000 members, I swear to God, number 11 on the funniest screenplays list was no. No! Yeah, and we did not make it happen it landed on number 11 it was so perfect <laughs> and everyone thought oh this is rigged you rigged it and like no it was number 11 i swear to god and you know the funny thing is with that movie i saw the other day that i saw like I, it was flying by my feet where i saw rob reiner come on he's like yeah when the movie first came out people were like why did you make this movie about this horrible band ah. like this is it's just like these guys are horrible. Like they truly thought it was a documentary. Like they had no understanding that it was a mockumentary. <laughs> That's a success. You've you, you like Bla- like Blair Witch. Like it, it you you've right. hit it. You've hit you've hit exactly the the bullseye on that. I don't think the dog show people are like you know. I thought you were funny. You were doing a a very straight documentary on dog show people. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, um, and local- so, yeah, let, so so let's take the, top three. The top three questions you would like to discuss in out of year eleven. Okay. What would be? Well, the first question is seems like the easiest and most obvious, but it's actually really important. The first question is, um, what is my story about? And what's interesting about that one is it it um, forces uh, the writer to distill their story into. I have it broken down into one sentence. And then a four sentence log line. And you'd be surprised at how hard it is for us, uh, we writers, we, for we, us writers, Mm -hmm. to uh, often distill our stories into a simple, um, uh, it's it's like a simple one sentence log line that tells the story. And that often tells us that our story is too complicated or it's unformed. So, like, I have an example here of, what I think is a really good uh, one sentence log line. You'll, you'll figure out the movie here real quick. <laughs> a good hearted but insecure king who suffers from a debilitating stutter mm-hmm. is forced to work with an eccentric speech therapist to deliver the speech that will save his kingdom. It's, pretty, it's as clear as day. That's a wonderful really log line. For, uh, obviously, that's Airbud 2. Actually, I think it was Airbud 2. Um, the electric, Air Bud to the electric boogaloo. Um, yeah. the- <laughs> what's good about that log line is it not only describes the central character, his best, his best attribute as well as his fatal flaw, which, by the way, is not his stutter, but is actually his insecurity. Um, the uh, his stutter is an antagonistic force. Um, we get the context; he's a king, um, 
and uh, is forced to work with an eccentric speech therapist. That tells us really the uh, the whole spine of the film. The whole second act of the film is him having to work with an eccentric speech therapist. We know there's conflict there because he's eccentric uh, and this king is insecure. To deliver the speech that will save his kingdom is the third act climax of the film. It's also the stakes of the film. So all of those really uh, key story elements are baked into that one sentence. And if you can't do that with your film, you may have a film or a story that's overly complicated. Uh, so I always start there. I do a one sentence log line and then I'll do a four sentence log line. Yeah. And that's one thing I found even in, when I did my writing um, and I've in all the scripts of stuff of, of scripts that I've read over the years is that sometimes writers they the story is they, they think they're so cool um and they're so complex that it's not about being the most complex script um it's about being the simplest getting the message across because you you have 90 minutes you have 90 pages to tell you've got this much to do and that's right and that's it, it. you can have a really complicated story but there has to be uh going back to billy ray he likes to say, what is the simple emotional journey? Mm -hmm. What is the simple, which is goes to your point, it can't be, the, the basic story can't be over, emotional journey. What's the emotional element that's going to really hook your audience? Um, you notice even in some of the best action films, there's always this emotional undercurrent of family. It's about brothers. It's a mother-daughter, uh, you know, or father-daughter story of my cat's knocking my computer off. Mm -hmm. Um, there's always some kind of, um, you know, it's a family, uh, like, uh, you know, in, uh, the, uh, fast and the furious movies, there's always an emotional, uh, story that winds through what could be the biggest, twistiest mission impossible movie ever. Uh, so what is the simple emotional journey is another good way of sort of summing up question number one, which is what is your story about? Mm -hmm. So that's an important one. I would say question four which is kind of two questions, is very important. I'm just looking at it here to get it right. Who is the central character and what is their conscious and unconscious desire? So obviously, who is the central character? It's good to really kind of home in on, uh, is this a, you know, who's who's the one who is really the hero of the story that, uh, that has the biggest arc? Or is it a two-hander? Or mm -hmm. is it an ensemble? But more importantly, what is their unconscious, their conscious and unconscious desire? And this is something after studying many, many films uh, that that really kind of formulated in my mind. Invariably, your character, your hero sets out with a want, a conscious desire. I want this. I need this money because I'm broke and they're going to break my uh, legs if I don't pay <laughs> off the, the debt or I'm in love with this girl or, you know, they want something. Their conscious desire. They go on a journey to get it. They have a flaw that's inhibiting them from a fatal flaw, which is another question, that's inhibiting them from being able to get to it. You know, they're fearful, they're insecure, they're greedy, they're whatever they are, or they're even too noble. However, during the course of the film, they often start to see that there's something else that they really want, an unconscious desire. And so then you get that tension between what they thought they wanted and what they discovered that they really want. So if like in The Matrix, if uh, Neo, what he really wants at the beginning of the film is just find out the truth about The Matrix. <clears throat> find out the truth about The Matrix. Uh, but he never imagined in a million years that he would have anything to do with his unconscious desire, which is to be the one, to acknowledge that he's the one and, uh, you know, and bring down The Matrix. He is so far from that at the beginning of the film. He just wants to know the truth. He's a cog. And his fatal flaw is his belief that all he is is really a cog in the machine, that he is too weak of a human to uh, be the one. And that's so, why you have the low point of the film, which is when he says to the, uh, the oracle, I am not the one, because he's given into his fatal flaw. Right. Now, l l I want to I take a character um, and put this on to the test, a character we all know, and I'd love you to analyze, Rocky. So. Uh, Okay, so Rocky. We all have seen Rocky. It's one of the most enduring characters of all time. As the 150 movies, um, he's they're catching up to Airbud <clears throat> in the amount of sequels. Um, 
but Stallone is getting up there. So I yeah. don't know how many more of these we can do. <laughs> well, yeah, he's had puppies, and uh, <laughs> Apollo Creed had puppies. Right, and exactly. Oh, so it's, so it's kind of the same. They, they, they stole our thunder. They obviously... <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly what Stallone thought when he was making the next ones. Um, all right, so Rocky, so what is his, his external goal and what's his subconscious goal? Yeah, so there are some movies where you have a noble character, um, a character who does have a noble conscious desire, but it's an impossible journey. So I always say either you have a character who's flawed and they have kind of this conscious desire, which is a selfish desire, but then along the way, they kind of fix themselves and, and find a selfless desire that um, that we as an audience want them to attain. However, there are movies like Rocky where you have a character who does have a noble conscious desire. He wants to be taken seriously as a boxer. Mm -hmm. He wants to be taken seriously as a boxer. He really feels like uh, that he he's a contender. He's he should be uh, taken seriously and no one's taken him seriously. That is a noble conscious desire. However, in his case, he has an impossible journey. He has an impossible journey where the entire world is basically against uh, him achieving his conscious desire, which is to be taken seriously. In this case, the uh, you know inciting incident is that he gets plucked. <laughs> he gets uh, plucked by God to uh to fight in this championship fight but it's a gimmick you know, right and he and he turns and he completely turns it down yeah he sees he he's, knows he's like no 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 this is i'm gonna get my ass killed i'm, I'm not ready for you champ <laughs> right so that's a that's a case where he actually uh you know he's a reluctant hero he saw something that an opportunity that was brought to him, but he knew at that place in the movie in the first act of the film, he's in no place, no condition to be able to go after that uh, particular golden ring. Uh, but then with the, you know, the encouragement of this, uh, of his uh, brother-in-law and this girl, Mickey. you know, Mickey, his old trainer, you know, people who used to believe in him or uh, the girl down the block who has her eye on, usually it's love, it's family that sort of encourages the hero to overcome their trepidation mm -hmm. and go on the journey. And so he does. And he's able to actually achieve, even though he doesn't win, uh, he achieves his conscious desire, which is to be very much taken seriously uh, as a fighter by the end of the film. He also achieves something of an emotional goal, which is uh, he finds love, which is a nice, again, whether Stallone knew uh, uh, about great storytelling or he just kind of, instinctually stumbled into it he had this great plot which is the the boxing plot and the training to become a fighter plot but he also had this wonderful uh couple of emotional subplots one involving adrian one involving uh adrian's brother another one involving mickey who's kind of the father mentor figure and it, it created this emotional journey that was under the boxing journey and, uh, you know, but that's that's one where the conscious desire actually is the same as the unconscious desire, but it's the journey that is the impossible journey. And the thing that's and I think that that little vein that he tapped into with the emotion of Rocky, because prior to Rocky, there were some boxing movies, uh, but nothing, nothing of that stat, of that um, not winning the Oscar and all that kind of stuff. Um but to sustain that character, who is absolutely loved throughout the world, um, and made but he made six Rocky movies and two Apollo Creed movie or Creed movies, and yet we're still on that journey, and we're actually going on that journey with him as he ages, and he's not hiding it anymore. <laughs> he did hide it, yeah. I think. In, in five, I think he. No, five. no, I think. Well, five, we we just it went from four to. To six let's just yeah we'll forget five we'll forget five like superman four yeah it's just yeah the quest for peace obviously um but <laughs> but there was something about that character and i think you're right it's not just a boxing because if it's just about boxing who cares like if it's just about a dude wanting because you could only see that movie so many times about him going to get the championship or losing the champ like there's only so many of those stories you can do but is that emotion it's adrian yeah. It's it's Mickey. Like when Mickey 
spoiler alert, when Mickey got killed in, in Rocky III, um, or when Apollo, you know, that, that emotion is yeah. what kept, kept it going because it's not about, you know, it's not about boxing. Kind of yeah. like Air Bud is not about a dog who plays basketball. Exactly. Exactly. And the wor- the films that fail are the ones that lean too heavily on their main plot, which is usually kind of an intellectual exercise, whether it's an action film or, a you know, that kind of th- thing. It's uh, it's the films that really go back and forth between or really more more effectively unite the emotional plot with the main sort of intellectual plot and have them bump into each other. And we see how you know, Rocky's pursuit of, uh, of the, of the crown is filtering into his relationships with Adrian and Mickey and, and Bert, uh, his name was not Bert, but, oh yeah, uh, Bert, um, Bert, um oh you know, the brother. Yeah, I know. Oh my God. Oh, it's going to drive me nuts now. I can't believe I can't remember what his, was it an Italian name. Was it like, <sighs> uh, Saul? No. No, okay, hold on. Keep, keep uh, so uh, while while you're while you're um, discussing the next um, the, the the last question we will go over in this episode. I will look up. Okay, so the, I'm going to say that <clears throat> although now you're distracted, so <laughs> no, gonna... no, no, I'm, I, but the audience is listening. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, I think you'll you'll ask really stupid questions that have nothing to do with the uh, thing I'm saying. You look it up. The third, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to um, question three. And this um, is actually the one. Polly, sir. Uh, Polly, Polly, sir. Let's Polly. move on. Let's, now we can move on properly, sir. It's Polly. <laughs> These are the important things. Yes, exactly. So, and, and, and third of the, of the 11 questions you would like to discuss. Okay. So the third of the 11 questions I'd like to discuss is actually question number three. A lot of my initial questions in the 11 questions are kind of foundational. Mm hmm. Uh, first act, backstory kind of questions, and then, you know, the later ones address low points and all that stuff. This question number three is the one that Billy Ray suggested uh, to me, uh, which is, what is the central idea? So this is an important one because it's not to be confused with the logline. It's different from the logline. The central idea, as I say in my book, is the overarching notion or theme that drives the story forward and is tested in every scene. It's it's like the thesis of your story. OK, so uh, and the question that it poses is often finally addressed by the critical test at the end of the story. So uh, an example might be, um, well, when Harry met Sally is interesting because uh, Nora Ephron, I'm pretty convinced, thought of this central idea before she even came up or wrote the script, which is can men and women be yeah. friends without sex getting in the way? Mm-hmm. That's the thesis. So she's like, I want to test that thesis. And so she, you know, introduces this woman who's coming off of this relationship and this man who just seems to be it's all about getting laid. And he throws them together where they uh, form. They start to form this friendship. That's this awkward friendship that starts to really grow over the course of the second act. But as it grows, there starts to become this sexual tension between them. And we as an audience start to wonder and worry, are they we want them to hook up? And yet we're worried that if they do, it'll ruin it. It'll ruin it. And in fact, you get the low point of the film, that wonderful shot after they've been in bed together and you start on um, Sally and she's smiling, um, you know, because she's happy and she thinks that, you know, and then you pull out and you see Billy Crystal with this look of horror. On yeah. her face. <laughs> right. So in that respect, the central the question posed by the central idea, can men and women be friends without sex getting in the way? The answer is no. Um, (laughs) according to Nora sir according to Nora (laughs) according to Nora but however they work it out because you know what they do by act three they go back to the foundation of their friendship and realize that actually what makes a a relationship so successful is having a foundation of friendship so in a way they turned that fatal flaw they turned that uh, that tension into actually something that made them grow as human beings and able to come together and have a permanent relationship so that's a key. If you can turn the low point into uh, what I call a critical test, mm-hmm. which is then drawing from your failure and realizing what you need to do to overcome your fatal flaw and actually, um, you know, self-actualize as a character. In that case, Harry and Sally needed to realize that, oh, we can actually combine the two. Our, the friendship that we formulated over several months is actually the key to having a successful relationship, 
once they were able to acknowledge that rather than run the other direction, that's when they were able to come together and, and have a you know successful climax, as it were. And anyone and anyone listening to this has has not uh, has thought of even thinking about writing a romantic comedy and has not watched When Harry Met Sally. Uh, shame on you! Stop listening to this right now and go watch it. I mean, Jesus. You watch it. Uh, when Harry Met Sally was, I think, if not the highest, one of the highest rated uh, uh, ranked films in the 101 funniest screenplays list. Exceptional script by Nora. Oh, and, and, and I mean, uh, I'm assuming I think Annie Hall. Um, is Any number one? Yeah, it it's, it's, it's honest, it honestly should be. I mean, it is uh, it's a masterpiece. Masterpiece. It's a, it's know, a masterpiece. What what one thinks of uh, of Woody Allen aside, the right. Any Hall is um, a is truly was a was a masterful film, um, and I guess that would be that would be considered a romantic comedy too. Yeah. I mean, they oh, absolutely. I mean, it's just with with his his wonderful writing um, in it. Uh, I I always I always put up certain films of a certain time period in my life if they were really good, um, because if I watch something from 1988 to 93, 94, which is my video store years, my high school yeah. years where I thought John claude Van Damme was the greatest actor of all time and Steven Seagal should have won an Oscar. In that time period of my life, um, if I've watched a movie like, and I remember vividly watching Annie Hall and going, God, that was good. You know, and, and yeah. watching Shawshank. Jesus, that was good. Yeah. You know, and it didn't have anyone, you know, breaking a leg. It was amazing. That's just amazing story. And when Harry met Sally, obviously. Um, and that's just amazing, really well-crafted story. And like we were talking about King's Speech earlier. You know, mm-hmm. on paper, I don't want to watch a movie about a prince who's got a stutter. Got, yeah, and I know. He's gonna, and he's going to learn. He's going to have this guy teach him how to speak for a speech. Like, that that's, that's, that's not sound good. But when you watch it, it did win the yeah, it won Best Picture that year. Best Picture and Best uh, Screenplay for David Seidler. And that was a spec script that, that no one would take a chance on. Uh, <laughs> right. I think he, he, like, literally stuck it in a... In, um, uh, either the actor's mailbox or the director's mailbox got it to, you know, because no one would read it, didn't have an agent, but he believed, and it was because even though it seemed like a ridiculous idea, there was such a strong emotional uh, story underneath it and right. so much at stake for delivering this speech. And, uh, you know, and it was a family a story of two guys that become sort of brothers and, uh, you know, a, a relationship story and his family. And he was in the shadow of his of his brother who abdicated, who was supposed to be the king. You know, he was never supposed to be the king. If you, if you as a screenwriter can connect emotionally, genre goes out the window. Um, Like the main plot, almost a lot of times, I'm like, if you can connect with the audience on an emotional level, all the addressing of plot and structure and character, I mean, obviously all that's needed to connect emotionally. Without it, you can't. But like, I mean, I've I've seen. Look, I've, sometimes I'll watch a movie with my daughters, and it's like something on Disney Plus or something, you know, like you know, something that I would have never in a million years watched by myself. And but they have this little nugget, just this mm-hmm. lip, and it's not it's not King's Speech. It's not going to be something that's long. It's not a meal. It's a snack. But that little snack of emotion holds mm-hmm. me. Just a little bit, and it just goes, you know, that got me. Just, and it might yeah. just be me because it was a, a, a daughter uh, story, it, or, or, or something that happened to me in my past that connected with me. But it connects when it connects, even on these like, like lifetime, like look at Lifetime. I mean, and 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 Hallmark. I mean, they made a living at doing nugget, <laughs> nugget. I'm I'm coining a phrase, nugget screenwriting, sir. Nugget emotional oh, nugget screenwriting. <laughs> But it's but it's true. Like if you can connect emotionally, how many people watched Air Bud and cried, cried, be- cried, yeah. bald because of the dog, just yeah. because of the dog and the boy relationship, which is completely fabricated because that's obviously a dog doesn't think this way. Um, <laughs> it's right. just a suspense of disbelief here. Right. But emotionally, like I remember watching um, what's Marley and Me. Oh Jesus Christ! Oh, it's a killer. Oh, I my God. cried. Uh, Marley and Me and oh. that um, uh, the film uh, in the, with the with the dog waiting at the train station. Oh, or, uh, H- 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 oh, Hidalgo or something like that. 
Hachi. Hachi, yeah, that one. Hachi, I have never... <laughs> my kids to this day make fun of me because I had to leave the room. Oh, right. I had to leave the room. Right, now, in, in, in the grand scope of things, uh, Hitachi, I've, and I've seen that film. Um, and I, I, that's a whole different thing. Hachi. Uh, Hachi, Hachi. Um, Hachi is like a washing machine. Yeah, it's a Hachi, not Hitachi, Hachi. Um, but yeah. I saw that film, and I, I had similar feelings towards that film. There might have been a tear or two that busted through uh, my eyeball at that time. Um, but in the grand scheme of cinema, not something that's on a list. Um, no, not important not, story not an important story not something that's studied but when you watch it if you've had a dog oh, yeah. connect and that's what that's why you, that's why the dog that saves christmas movie or the dog that does anything kind of movie yeah. if you can connect to the emotion of having a dog anybody who's ever had a dog will connect to it emotionally even well, if it's when we project so much purity onto yeah. our dogs yeah. so much purity their motives their loyalty their love is so pure that we project all these kind of human uh, qualities on, onto them. And so when they're distressed or when they're going off after some um, uh, you know, impossible quest or whatever it is, we get pulled in emotionally. Um, but it's the same with brothers, sisters, fathers, children. Uh, whales, free willy. Whales. <laughs> <laughs> all those things. I mean, how many free willies were there? There was like five of those, four of those. Right? I know, free willy. Well, you know, but again, it, it, it goes to the the best friend. The whale is the best friend. The human it's emotional. Is, the dog is the best friend. It's all about these emotional connections. And this is why when my students, they turn in their scripts and they're really the, you know, complex action or horror or comedy, silly comedies, you know, they're just so I'm like, I read three pages and I'm zoning out because there's nothing pulling me in. And I just drill into them uh, every day, every class. You've got to insert them. Even in the silliest comedy, scariest horror film, you have to insert these emotional elements, oh. family elements, friends, mentors. Dumb and Dumber. Got it. Dumb and Dumber. Like right. the original Dumb and Dumber, absolutely absurd. Like it's absurd. Absurd. The whole – the humor is absurd. I love it by the way. It's crazy. But there's so much emotion and purity to their – not only their friendship but their journey because he wants to – he saw this girl and like, you're saying there's a chance. And that that's what drives the story. But there's emotion. It's not just two dudes just walking around doing fart jokes all day. Right. You know, their goal is emotional and their relationship is emotional. Right. So it's, uh, you know, so a lot of times but going back to the uh, question, what is the central idea? A lot of times what I'll do is try to think about the arc of the character and the, the emotional journey of the character and bake it into uh, the central idea. So, for instance, The Matrix, which is a very heady. You know, oh, um, <laughs> but really is about yeah. self-discovery. And certainly, ultimately, love is the thing that uh, convinces him that he is the one, you know, because she's whispering in his ear. Right. I knew that you'd be because I yeah. said, uh, yeah. you know, the Oracle. That's not a uh, very good impression of Carrie Ann Moss. I'm just saying. <laughs> I do a much better Larry Fishburne. That's exactly. Neo. Neo, exactly. So the the central idea for um, uh, for the Matrix is Neo can only get over his uh, sense of being a cog in the wheel and accept that he and be the one is when he accepts that he is the one when he believes that he is the one. So if you think of the set of like the arc of Neo over that film, um, he wants to know what what the Matrix is. He wants to know the truth. After he learns the truth, he's kind of happy to be a foot soldier in uh, in um, uh, Morbius's uh, little army. But God forbid he doesn't want the responsibility on his shoulders. He's resisting. He still believes he's a cog mm -hmm. like we all kind of do that. Mm -hmm. We're powerless. It's only when he gets over his belief that he's a cog and believes that he is the one when he is able to uh, to be the one. And uh, that is really the central idea of the film. And it really that notion is tested in almost every scene in the movie in one way or the other. That thesis, mm -hmm. Neil can only be the one when he believes he's the one.
is tested in every scene in the movie in some form or another. So that's why it's really important to have a central idea because what it does is create something of, a, of an emotional spine that ties your story together. Otherwise, you might have something that kind of meanders or feels episodic and, and isn't cohesive. And that's why that film and that franchise, specifically that film, though, um, has has aged so well. And people look at it as, as it's a masterpiece. It really is truly a masterpiece of its time. Um, there's a lot of films that came out in that era that were visual effects heavy and action and all that stuff. But we don't speak about that. But because um, they're not held at the same level as The Matrix is. Why? Because of that emotion. That That's that. Right. That, because at a, at a, and if we get a little philosophical here, uh, we all have to, once we believe we can do, we do, you know. It really is. It's a movie about faith. It is a movie about faith. Right. And, 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 and generally in our industry as a whole, and I'm really going to go deep here, um, we won't achieve what we want to achieve until we believe we can achieve it. And if that's the starting point. Like, if you can't believe you're going to write a, a, a screenplay, you're never going to write a screenplay. As like, as Henry Ford, was it Henry Ford? I think he said, like, if you believe that you can or you can't, you're right. Mm-hmm. That's and, good. I mean, if that's, you're, you're absolutely, if you really can't or you really you can't, you're right. So it's up to you to believe to move forward. I do want to ask one more question um, before yeah. I, I ask you my series of questions. I ask all my guests because um, we could talk for hours. I, I know. Um, can we put a te- can we put the test to the, the the three questions we've just talked about to one film that I'm I'm just beating it up in my head trying to, and I haven't seen it in a while and I actually have to watch it again. Are you ready? Are you ready to see if we could test this one? All right. A- Airplane. 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 Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yes. So, so yes. I, I remember it. Yeah, you, you tell me what what is the most simple emotional journey of uh, airplane? Um, well, obviously to survive the the plane. Um, it, well, I mean, there's that. There's that's the plot. The plot is to, to land. But if I remember, and, have, and again, I haven't seen it probably in like ten years, other than like in a in a sitting. I've seen clips of it over over the last ten years. But if I remember correctly, the main character who was the pilot, there was an emotional. There was some sort of emotional attachment to the stewardess. I got stewardess, flight attendant. Sorry, they called her stewardess back then. Um, a flight attendant, um, and there was that kind of. There was something drawing those two together, and there was a love story at the end of the day. If I'm not, if I, yeah. I, I just remember all the funny parts. I don't because it's just well, so funny. If you remember the Robert, uh, what's his name? Robert Robert Hayes. The main, Robert, Robert Hayes. Yeah. Um, he was a broken, a broken guy. Yes. Uh, with a drinking yes. problem, you know, yes. he drink throat in his eye. He had a drinking <laughs> problem because he led a mission uh, yes. where yes. George Zipper or whatever uh, crashed. Right. right. <laughs> so it was funny, but at the same time, it's it's a true emotional thing. He led a failed uh, journey as a pilot. He People died under his watch. Yep. It's led to him having a broken kind of life yep. lo- where he couldn't love or be loved. Um, and he is stuck on this plane and he gets pulled reluctantly into the pilot seat and he's able to do it by virtue of Julie Haggerty's yes. kind of see uh, love for him. Yep. You know? Now I remember it. Now it all, it all came coming back, but that's right. So you, th- so that's the yeah. driving force of it. I mean, the movie is remembered because it's just so damn funny. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's. It's, it's still but that had an emotional story, but it, add, um, but but without but listen again without that emotion you don't the story can't move. There right. is, it's there, just a bunch of gags. It's just then it's just sketch comedy at that point. Um, right. you know what sketch comedy point. kit out after one sketch comedy kit and there's no emotional throughput. Um, or right. line or foundation. So I, I just wanted to bring airplane up because it's a it's a unique because that's a slapstick comedy. And well, yet, this is why those those slapstick spoofs, and, you know, the scary movies and things like that, guns, some yeah. of them work. Most of them get terrible reviews. A lot of them fail. Um, they have to be under 90 minutes because they just cannot sustain. Airplane is kind of considered a, a classic because not only are is it funny as hell and the jokes really work and, and most Even of today. them at least. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah uh, there's some, yeah. yeah. Some of them, uh, some of them wouldn't play so well today. Right. Or Blazing Saddles, um, the same thing. I mean, Jesus. I know, right? Blazing Saddles, too. <laughs> but they had, but even Blazing Saddles, too, there's a strong emotional oh, uh, root interest in that. We, It's a friendship. 
between mm-hmm. a, a broken, uh, you know, uh, uh, shooter uh-huh. who was shot, you know, uh, uh, Gene Wilder and uh, Cleavon Little, who's a um, a hero who happens to be black at a time where you cannot be a hero in a black and black. Oh. All right. So and they form this uh, friendship, this this almost love story between these two guys. <laughs> so good. You're rooting for them. All right. Oh, I'm just so gonna, I'm playing as we're talking. I'm playing back scenes in my head, and I'm just laughing because, I mean, Blazing Saddles just oh my god, it's so, so good. It's it's. I'm, I'm not sure if uh, Blazing Saddles would work today or not, uh, but it's it really you know, is an anti-racist film. No, Mel actually talked about. That. I mean, he did the Hitler like uh, was it that Hitler movie? Um, uh, I forget. Yeah, I the, this. It was not si- not silent movie, but the um. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, History of the World Part Two. Yes. Uh, then, and, well, History of the World Part Two had like Hitler. Well, no, the producers. The producers, for God's sake. It's a the, the, oh, producers. One of the greatest. I mean, it's a it's, it's it's about a play about about Hitler. I mean, come on. Yeah, it was time for Hitler. <laughs> so, but I actually I actually just saw a recent interview with Mel uh, Mel Brooks, the writer of Blazing Saddles, who said that. It, it, today it wouldn't get produced. There's no way a studio would produce that film today. Um, but if you look at it, it is an it's a, an anti-racism. It's it's completely making fun of it. And you when you make fun of things like that, those image that imagery, that that kind of toxic stuff that they're talking about, um, it just brings them down. It it, it takes them off their pedestal. Like okay. Hitler, like you know, obviously, like you know, springtime for Hitler. I mean, he destroyed him <laughs> Chaplin yeah. did it Chaplin did it as well in the in, in the dictator in the great dictator so yep. it, there is a there's a place for that um now will it offend people obviously it's gonna offend somebody because that's the world we live in um but uh I, mean, I again Aaron we could talk for at least another two hours about story and this this is fantastic I, I love this interview I'm gonna ask you a few questions I ask all my guests um what are three screenplays every screenwriter should read Ooh, um, okay. I would say, um, boy, it caught me off guard. Um, <laughs> I would say Shawshank Redemption. Yes, Man After um, My Own Heart. I love that one. Um, I would say, I love Network. I love the, the yes, screenplay so um, for Network, uh, written by, um, what's his name? You know. The, 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 the guy with the dude and the stuff. Yeah, got it. Yeah, the, that guy. I'm I'm really bad at names, and it's bad because you know screenwriters are always you know <laughs> forgotten. They're like, who who wrote that? Yeah, who? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Who's who's the I DP? <laughs> yeah, he's the guy. But, uh, you know, um, and so I would say uh, network in terms of really great sort of like societal um, societal, uh, uh, kind of like being able to tell a story that really holds a mirror up to society's foibles and, and all of that. Um, uh, and, and I think you could release it in theaters today and it would probably get the same reaction. <laughs> yeah. It, it might even be more relevant <laughs> yeah. today. Um, what else? Um, I actually really liked, I would say get out would be a good one to that's study. Really, yeah, that's a really great script. Because it's it's a great script. It works as a pure genre film. It works as a great character story. It kind of is a, follows the formula of the eight sequences, which I, I teach in my three acts, eight sequences, um, you know, uh, first act, second act, uh, midpoint. It has yeah. a low point. So it follows a lot of the sort of the formula of, of good writing or typical writing. But it also then um, also kind of like has this undercurrent of – uh, of satire to it that's very yeah. kind of put in there in horror and and i mean there is satire in horror like um oh god uh george romero day of yeah, the dead I, I, uh, night of living dead but day of the dead uh, it was a day of the dead was the one in the dawn of, dawn of the dead yeah in a, in a mall yeah, yeah the mall one that was completely satirical about yeah. everything he was trying to say yeah, there great horror can do that yeah. Okay. So those those are very three good choices. Um, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Okay. So this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, I know that what people 
the the inclination might be that I need to write my Avengers or I need to write something that is like, uh, you know, a, a home run, big box office film. But what people are really looking for are unique voices and they're looking for um, disruptive stories. Um, so and this today, better than any time in history, is a great time to tell a story from a point of view that has not been told before whether it's um, LG, uh, LGBTQ stories, um, you know, uh, African-American stories, Latino, Asian stories. It's time. It's a good time now to uh, to tell uh, stories that are not just white male hero stories, um, you know, and you don't have to be. Um, and that's the other thing is that I, I often my um, uh, writers of color that are in my class, the women, you know, they feel this pressure to write. Uh, stories about uh, women and writers of color, and they really want to write something else. I'm like, do it, write something else. There's no better time than right now to write something, write the story that you want to write, even though it seems fringe or weird or uh, or, or plays with structure. Um, agents, producers, they are looking for fresh voices, uh, wild stories, um, you know, uh, stories told from the fringes. Um, but again, even in those kind of stories, as long as there's an undercurrent of human emotion that that we all can relate to, this is why um, Parasite did so well. Uh, Parasite is really a story of a family who is aspiring to be greater than they were, and they kind of went the wrong route to do it. And kind Slightly. Of paid the price. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was a family story, uh, but it was twisted as hell. So I would say the advice is to write something disruptive, write something um, that's going to surprise, not something that people are going to expect. Fair enough. Uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? You know, it really is about character. And th this is such a, and I, I tell my students this too, I used to come up with these really big gimmick, great high concept movies. Um, and I would just sort of like, you know, pour everything into the concept and not think enough about the character. Mm -hmm. You know, what's this character, what is, um, what's their, what's their central major flaw? What, uh, what do they want? What do they think they want? Um, who are they? What are their, what's their personality? What's their backstory? Where do they come from? So now I really force myself to think a lot about my character. How can I make my heroes different than, you know, usually you make the supporting characters really interesting, but the hero is really vanilla and generic. How can I make my you know, maybe instead of a you know white male lead in this horror film, I'll make it a diminutive, mute cleaning lady of a woman. Um, and maybe my film will be more interesting um, with a character like that, who I've really thought about her backstory, that she's mute and yet she's also full of a spitfire and spunky. She loves watching dancing. Uh, you know, she believes in, you know, that monsters are not necessarily monsters. She yearns for love, but also knows when to let it go. You know, think about all those character traits before I actually write. Sounds familiar. In. Sounds familiar. I don't. It should be a movie, I think. I think you should write that into a movie. Absolutely. When, um, when you were saying that there was a character that I, I was remembering that is such a wonderful character, Leon from the um, from the professional or Leon, um, John Renault. He he loved watching old like you know he he took care of a plant like that was a thing. You, you saw you mean I'm assuming you see that movie right? Here's a, yeah, yes. here's a, he took care of the plant. He used to watch uh, I think either Charlie Chaplin or no dancing. He Fred Astaire. So he he was an innocent child like that's so different of a hitman yes. than a hitman would have been. Like imagine if that would have been just a, a gruff just a gruff dude yeah. that was a war vet. Um, the cliche. Right, but he's completely different, and then he has to take a, a girl, and then he has to teach a girl how to be a hitman. That's that's uh, interesting. It's far more interesting. Far, yeah. far more and interesting. And that's true. And if you take the time, and sometimes it takes half a day, you know, or a day, to really think about your character without, like, you know, getting into the script and the plot. Think about the character and how to make your character. Actually, my question too in my thing is, how are you um, honoring and disrupting your genre? You want to do the same thing with your central character. How is your central character? How are you honoring your genre with your central character? But how are you also disrupting uh, the genre with your central character? You know, how can you make them different? Something that makes them pop and that makes them okay. interesting. 
you know, um, uh, C- Cameron Crowe is really good at creating characters like that. Um, you know, as good as it gets. And uh, no, that's James. Um, that's, that's James, James L. L. Brooks. Yeah. James L. Brooks and Cameron Crowe. They spent a lot of time thinking about their characters, Greta Gerwich, before they actually uh, even think about the, what the plot is. Now, what is what was the biggest fear you had to overcome to write your first screenplay? That I would um, be exposed as a fraud. Yeah. You a know, lot of people get that answer. It's yeah. Just, it's just, uh, you know, my concern that I would write this thing and it would suck and people would hate it. And you know what? My first screenplay, probably half the people did hate it. And the other half of the people said, eh, you got promise, but call me later, kid. Um, and it was them. It was the positive, constructive encouragement that I got from the handful of people that saw that in my first script that I had some promise, that I was I was going for something that encouraged me to write the second one and do it better. But boy, getting over the, the fear of failure and rejection, it's a big one. And in what is and what did you learn from your biggest failure? The character thing. Okay. You know, um, the, uh, re- one of the first films that my old partner and I wrote was some kind of Jack and the Beanstalk uh, story. And it was just filled with gimmicks. And we just didn't spend any time really thinking about Jack's character. And it was this huge, it was like it went out to the town, it was going to be this auction, the agency was all thought this was going to, this was like, I think right after Air Bud was getting made and we were, you know, kind of hot. And, um, or after uh, Disney bought it, but it hadn't come come out or something. And um, it's just everyone passed. And it's because they just, it, the emotional thing, they weren't pulled in emotionally with this character or his journey. And, um, and that's when I realized I have to... Um, spend more time thinking about character and emotion. Now, where can people find uh, out about the book, about your work, and, uh, and and find out more about you? Well, you can go to my website, aaronmendelson.com, and that's Mendelssohn, S-O-H-N.com, or you can also find my book, The 11 Fundamental Questions, on Amazon. Uh, but uh, on my website, there's a link to uh, the Amazon page uh, through, uh, through the website, and you can also sign up you know, to be on my mailing list and, and get updates and that kind of thing. Very cool. Aaron, man, thank you. It's I, like I said, man, we could keep talking for at least another two, three hours. So I do appreciate you taking the time out um, to talk to the tribe and, and hopefully help them along their screenwriting path. So thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex.